This was a big account. It had, sort of, what, 400,000 followers? Yeah, like almost 500,000 followers. So, so a massive account. And what it's doing is it's basically uh, collating stories for you. It's saying, well, this is a, a, an important story. This is about to go viral. And from what I saw, it was continually linking to the original story. It was, it was effect ineffectively no different from me quote tweeting an article saying, this is interesting. Why is that against the terms of service? Right, so it was a news aggregator service. As you said, it picks out the most interesting stories, the biggest and also the ones that skipped under the radar. Yeah. Found the most interesting line within them. And Nick did this thing. He would tweet out that line, get loads of attention, and then follow up the tweet with a link to the piece. This, right. was, this was great for a lot of people because it meant they could get all the news without following 100-plus journalists and seeing updates about their cats and yeah. their latest attempt to cook spaghetti or whatever. And they, surely they, they could just get the news. Isn't it good for the publications as well? Well, yeah, well, the, the concern that apparently is that um, by posting the link in a follow-up tweet instead of in the original, it was detracting traffic away from these outlets and these publications and right. instead directing it all to the news aggregator. Basically, in short, this 19-year-old was better at sharing the news than the professionals who've been doing it for decades. So do you think that's really the motivation behind this? Because I can't oh, yeah. see... I mean, I know their terms of service are incredibly mm -hmm. vague, but I can't see how this possibly violates it, anything. Yeah. The rules that they have stipulated for the reason why this account was banned um, were the strangest and weakest links they could yeah. have made. Spam being one of them, OK? So the, the accusation is that politics for all... It was a big brand. It had other accounts like Football for All and all these kind of other issues. And um, the, you know, the charge was that one account was sharing another account's um, stuff. So this was right. spamming and this was kind of a strange thing. That very weak. Right, well, it was other, other news outlets publish their... Like, retweet their sports publication and they don't get banned. But for some reason, this kid doing yeah. a very good job beating everyone else at the game, he gets punished for it. And the other one is that he was sensationalist. He found the best line and distorted the news with his way of doing things. This is what all news organisations do. And I would say that politics for all was far more accurate than most. We did not see Twitter punishing The Independent when it falsely claimed on its front page uh, online that Carl Rittenhouse shot three black people when he was cleared of all charges earlier this year. In fact, he'd shot uh, a paedophile and uh, an Antifa felon. So, I mean, the, the facts um, sometimes get missed by news outlets. But well, when... it's not against the rules to be wrong. News, out news outlets correct themselves when they make mistakes. Right. But quoting from the article itself, mm -hmm. how could that be possibly be deemed sensationalist? So I don't think it has been. This is, no, a, right. this is, this is a false charge. Yep. What really seems to be the problem here, as, as I've alluded to before, Nick Moore, this 19-year-old guy, yep. was better than the journalists at doing their job. And perhaps also there is another concern here that um, Twitter is launching its own news aggregator service and uh, politics okay. for all doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Kind of running the show, basically, on this aggregator line. And we don't have that in the UK. We haven't had a good one like that before. And this kid you know, launched his own so and beat the competition. Is so this part of, like, Twitter's drift to uh, ideological drift? In other words, like, oh, yeah. you know, we, we know that Dorsey has gone now and the new guy is... is, is, is a lot mm -hmm. of people say is even worse. Oh, yeah. Are we going to see more and more uh, censorship for, by big tech? I think almost certainly. Just looking back in the last year, of course, it's just over a year now since the Capitol Hill riots, mm. Twitter used a very strange um, charge to ban the sitting president, Donald Trump, last year yeah. over, a, I would say, a pretty false claim that he incited violence, completely lacking in any um, understanding of personal responsibility and, I say, misrepresenting his tweets on the day. Yeah. And so a lot of people were happy to ignore that, let's be honest. A lot of well, people, because they hated Trump. Well, they hated, they hated Trump more than they cared about freedom of speech yeah. and then they cared about open discussion and he's the most powerful man in the world. He shouldn't be banned yeah. from a news platform you know, just because you don't like him. You'd say it's in the public interest to hear what he has to say. Uh, yeah, that's, that sounds about right to me. Yeah. So, it, so a whole year passed, right, and everyone kind of forgot about this ban and thought, well, it's OK, we can move on. Suddenly, yeah. this, this up-and-coming, sprightly young entrepreneurial man who's launched this um, news aggregator, he gets banned on even shadier grounds. Yeah. And now, finally, some people are smelling the coffee that all the kind of the right-leaning accounts and the free speech liberals like yourself have been shouting about for a year, saying, yeah. uh, guys, big tech has a huge stranglehold over the news media. Yes. With a, a cocktail of algorithms and influential accounts, they can set an agenda far more effectively than a front-page newspaper. It matters enormously. If they can ban Donald Trump, they can ban you. Yes, and so, I mean, some of the reasons they gave for banning Donald Trump are so tenuous. I mean, they even quoted one of his tweets saying that he would not attend the inauguration. Mm. And they claimed that that was a dog whistle mm. to his followers to go and cause violent bother on the day because he wouldn't be there. That's, I mean, that's quite a reach, isn't it? Yeah, I know. That's yeah. an incredible reach. So, you know, what do we do about this? I mean, I spoke earlier to Jason Miller of Getter, mm -hmm. and it looks like Getter is really exploding now in terms of its, its popularity. Mm -hmm. Do you think, ultimately, that's going to be the have to be the way is through competition? Competition is important here, but... Um... Um, I think some officials are going to have to look in the public space at how they regulate big tech, big tech to make it more 
um, more friendly towards a free speech culture. Doesn't that present a problem for right-leaning people and libertarians who think that, you know, these are private companies, they can do whatever they mm. want? What do, you, what do you make of that argument? I think it uh, presents a problem for libertarians, but not right-leaning people. I think right. libertarians are happy to lose while they uphold the laws <laughs> okay. and say, let's you know, stand up for our enemies as they kind yeah, of but if you, gleefully if right, scythe us away. Yeah. But if you believe in free market capitalism, then you can say, well, you know, they make their own rules, they, they make their own decisions, we I, shouldn't get involved. I think the influence of big tech over our national conversations over the discussion of news is too important to let it, si let it be sidelined by, I would say, outdated visions of how the market should operate on the internet. So you would like to see maybe an internet bill of rights or some kind yeah, of... Yeah, something along those lines. I mean, I think that tweets often now are more important than someone standing on a, a soapbox outside of Parliament or, yeah. or, or, or you know, offering a petition around. You can, you can do a lot more effectively in terms of disseminating ideas and information online than anywhere else. But how is this going to work? I mean, our government here are currently pushing through the online mm -hmm. safety bill. Yeah. They want to put extra pressure on social media companies to uh, enforce what they consider hateful content. Mm -hmm. Actually, they even use the phrase... Um, uh, legal but harmful yeah. content. That's it coming from our government, right? Yes, no. That's not, so, you know, to be fair to the big tech companies, and I often give them a good bashing, <laughs> but they are under a lot of pressure from governments to censor. Yeah, well, they are, but um, at the same time, they're not doing a particularly good job of exercising themselves from their own demons. Right. You know, um, they censor, but only really in one direction. So a conservative government is putting them under pressure to make their platforms cleaner, cleaner and safer and more appropriate to all ages, and they are turning around, not doing a particularly good job of that, and banning right-leaning right -leaning politicians. So this is, this is not a good way of going about it. On, on, your, on your point before about competition in this space, we would all love to see uh, a massive competition of um, pro-free speech organisations battling about to see who could have the best discussions, yeah. the most engagement. But what we find generally is that actually platforms that host these apps, alternative ones like um, Parler and Gab, for example, yeah. they just get banned straight away. The App Store bans them, Google Play bans them. They don't even have a chance, they don't even have a free playing field no. to engage with the big names like YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. The competition doesn't really exist. And this, uh, this new platform like Getter, you said, sure, they're interesting places, but they attract one voice. A good thing about Twitter is that I can rile up people who disagree with me and dislike well, me. But and if I go on Getter and I just have like the same people who agree with me all the time, what is the point? Well, I, yeah, but I've got a hope now because I'm seeing more and more left-leaning people go to Getter now. Because what I think kind of left-leaning people? Though? Well, a lot of gender-critical feminists, okay, so that, instance, yeah. They're just not on the left anymore, let's be honest. No, they've of course been, they are. They, of course no, they are. they're not. This is ludicrous. I mean, your definition of left and right is different from mine. Yeah, probably. So, so I would say that if you're on the left and you believe, for uh -huh. instance, in uh, you believe in the welfare state, you believe mm -hmm. in the redistribution of wealth. These are uh, pretty standard stuff. Yeah, but then you get into being gender-critical. Oh, you're far out the door. Well, no, but this, this speaks to a, a redefinition of what it means sure. to be left and right-wing. And I don't believe that we should let go of that because a, there are many, many mm -hmm. years of writing and expertise on these subjects. Mm -hmm. to, be, uh, to believe that there are two biological sexes is not a right-wing position. It is now. It is non-partisan. <laughs> I, right? I, I disagree. I think it is now. The, the part of the cathedral of the left, the, the theories that they hold under special religious orthodoxy, one of them is that biological sex isn't real. So well, I'm, what I'm I would afraid. say to you is you are giving your enemies too much power. Mm. You are allowing uh, your political opponents to decide for you what yeah. left and right means. I wouldn't surrender that to okay, them. Well, think, that's my view of that. I think, and I think, no, it's not just, and to be fair, it's not just gender critical feminists. I think people are, even on the left, uh, really hungry mm -hmm. uh, for a chance to speak more because I think these ideologues mm -hmm. who just want to shut down discussion, they're a minority. I think uh, there was a, a survey by More in Common and they estimated that about 13% of the population would be these identity-obsessed ideologues mm -hmm. who don't believe mm -hmm. in free speech, right? That yeah. means that in every given generation, the majority want a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Don't you think... Have any? I've, we spoke about this on my show recently, mm -hmm. but don't you think that there is hope for the young people? I mean, you were saying that basically <laughs> young people like censorship and I was saying the opposite. Uh -huh. do, do, do you, have you just written off uh, Generation Z? Is that what happened? Um, I think there's a level of fragility there we're going to have to accept. And I think actually, I think generally studies show that um, elder people um, tend to be more censorious than younger people. Right. But there's a different kind of censorship based on kindness. Right. Um, they, they wrap it up in these terms of being generous to your opponent. You can't um, use the, 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 the redefinition of hate, for example, yes. is a very interesting way of doing this. Um, whereas older censors don't look at it this way. They just go, right, wrong, wrong should be banned. Yes. And so, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't retain the, the hope and glee that you have. I think you're right, 13% or whatever, a minority of people have... They're these, in power, though. They, they have the power. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all great being part of the 87%, but we're not running Twitter. Uh, yeah, I think... We're I think... not in charge of government. <laughs> we're not in charge of the NGOs, the charities, the universities, the schools. We are on the receiving end of a very punitive 
very silencing system. Yeah, well, I think we broadly agree about big tech censorship, but I think we disagree about... I think I'm probably more optimistic than you are. Oh, that sure. the majority will win out, but we will find out. I mean, maybe Charlie's right about that. <laughs>